Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Spirit School. I am so excited today to bring in one of my new mediumship besties, though I think we've known each other now for at least six or seven months on Instagram. I admire the pants off of her. We've gotten to know each other so well over these past few months. I'm very excited to introduce Tony Willis, who's also known as Soul Star Medium on Instagram. How are you today, Tony? I am doing so good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. Yes. And so the sound quality is going to be slightly different for this episode. I'm not using my podcast mic because you get two powerful mediums into one space and it took us like 10 tries to get zoom sound to work. Two mediums during like mercury retrograde. What the heck? I was so nervous. (laughs) (laughs) It was so funny. So thank you, Tony. I kind of want to just start like me, why I love Tony so much. I just wanted to give the audience a little bit of background. Like why I love Tony so much is because she is like courageous to the next level. Like I consider myself to be a very courageous medium, a very courageous woman, but Tony shares perspectives on her Insta that a lot of mediums at our level think, but don't share because it does rock some boats. It does fluff some feathers. I would not want to be in Tony's DMs, but she is so strong. She can definitely like hold her own. So we're actually going to talk about some of the misconceptions and, you know, not so popular topics when it comes to mediumship. And I couldn't have a more perfect, uh, sovereign badass bitch on the podcast to talk about these things. Cause this is what her Insta is about. And this is why I love her so much. And so you ready, you feel good about it all. Yes, I am super ready. Let's go. (laughs) Awesome. Well, first I wanted to talk about like your development journey. Like what's your origin story when it comes to being drawn to the mediumship path and give us a little bit of like your background. Yeah, of course. So um, it kind of all started for me um, in 2016. Um, I'm adopted. And so I was going through a lot of personal struggles with that, with wanting to find where I came from and who I am and just all of this stuff. And a few years prior to that, I had lost both my dad and my sister within six months of each other, uh, very unexpectedly. And I also was a new mom at the time. So my son was barely six months old when my sister passed and then um, just over a year old when my dad passed. So all of that compounded with losing two of the most important people in my life was really huge. I did not deal with my grief at at all whatsoever. Um, just because I, I didn't have time, you know, I'm a new mom. I, I don't, I couldn't deal with it, you know? And so fast forward about five years later and I was going through, um, figuring out who I was through the adoption. And I kind of just said to myself, you know what? I, I feel like there's something more, there's gotta be something more out there. I mean, are they really gone forever? Like, am I never going to see my dad and my sister again? And so I ended up finding this workshop on past lives because I've always been very interested in past life regression. And I attended it. And um, as we were going into the meditation, I started getting messages, but it wasn't messages for me. It was for other people in the group. Like someone's dad came forward and told me that they had died from liver disease. And I was really scared to say that because my whole life, I've always wanted this ability. I've always watched the ghost shows and all of that stuff. And I'm like, I, I want to know how to do this. And so when it came to me, I was really shocked because at that time, I thought that this was only given to a select few people, like not everyone could do it. Um, and I ended up during that workshop telling people what I had received and it made sense to them. And so from that point, I was like, wow, this is crazy. Um, I think I can talk to my dad and my sister now and like heal through that. And so that for the last four years has completely been my journey of just showing people that our loved ones are still with us. They're still here. They want to be with us. They'll never go away. Um, And to be able to bring people that peace is just life-changing, not just for them, but for me as well. It heals me every time I get to do a reading for people. So, yeah. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And so your development journey, what was that like? Like, what were some of the fears that came up that you had to kind of like walk through? Like, who were your teachers? Because I know we had very different teachers as well. And I'm having one of your teachers on the podcast in a few weeks, which I'm really excited about. And I could see why you have such strong opinions, like, and he does too. And it's like, 
I love that. I wish I, I had that really early on in my development. I had the opposite. So I'm curious to know a little bit about that part of your journey too. Yeah. So when I first started, I mean, I didn't know anything there. There's no like rules or guidebook that says it needs to be done a certain way. So I just found people that were like, oh, I'm a medium and I help others develop their abilities. And so I would sign up for their classes or take their workshops in person. And I was taught a lot of um, fear-based practices, I would say, or a lot of rituals that just were time consuming and did not make sense. And with the type of personality that I have, I'm very all or nothing. So if someone says to me, you need to sit and meditate for 30 minutes and you need to light a candle and put it on the left side of your desk and you need to have this crystal in your hand and use this to connect, like I'm going to do it because they know better than me, right? But as my development kept progressing, stuff just wasn't making sense. It wasn't resonating anymore. And I, I mean, I have my son, I homeschool, so I'm like, I can't afford to sit for 30 minutes, then do a 45 minute reading, then ground myself for another 30 minutes afterwards. I'm like, I don't have time for this. <laughs> so it just, it started to just not make sense. And then luckily I was able to find um, Charlie Kelly, who I think you were talking about, mm -hmm. and a couple of other teachers who were very grounded in their practices, very practical. And they just showed me, no, it's so simple. Like take away all the nonsense that, that clouds your mind. Just allow it to be a surrender to spirit and connect and you'll see how easy it is. And because of that, my whole mindset and philosophy shifted. And now it's like my goal to get people to understand that, that you don't need all the rituals. You don't need to feel guilty for not doing the rituals, like just surrender and connect and you'll be good to go. Yeah. That's why I tell people about sitting the power. Like I'll give them a meditation recording, but I'm like, look, this is not something I want you to like overthink. It's like, I feel like sitting in energy, then do it. But the last thing I always get people in my mentorship, the first thing they say to me is like, I haven't meditated. I'm like, that's so cool. Like I don't meditate. <laughs> it's all good. Right. And I was yeah. actually, I'm doing Mavis's advanced mediumship mentorship right now. And even yesterday she was saying, she's like, I don't meditate. I don't do anything to prepare to connect with spirit. Like she just like rocks up and just like, can act. So I'm like, that's so refreshing because we yeah. have all these, like, like all these things that just like keep us so busy and make us feel like constantly, like we're not doing enough and therefore can't do the thing that I want to do. Right. It's just all these barriers. Um, yeah. so I love that. I love that. I still have never had a teacher that's, um, taught like that before, but it's something like I've just figured out through the years too. I'm like, shit, one time I didn't have time to cleanse my chakras and pray. I just had to like go and read and it worked. I was like, holy crap, like it worked. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And there's, um, I was part of, um, James Van Prague's mediumships course level two last year. And, uh, my circle was meeting, um, on a Thursday night and we were out and I was like, Oh, we'll have enough time to get back home, hook up to the Wi-Fi, you know, do my circle. And we didn't. And so I had to sit at a public library to steal their Wi-Fi to connect into zoom and then a street parade started going down the street <laughs> and I'm having to do a reading for someone and, but it, it worked. I still was able to connect and that was crazy. And so now when people give the excuse of like, oh, I'm distracted or oh, it's too loud or I need it to be quiet. I'm like, no, you don't. Yeah, no, yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> I remember doing a psychic fair, like before I was like out and about as a medium and there was nine tables in probably a 600 square foot studio. And so like the tables were like, there's enough so like to, for somebody to shimmy to the side, to the other table. So all these different people talking and crying, all the different energy and like we could still read. And so yeah. I, I kind of agree. I mean, I'm all about making sacred space because it makes you feel good. And yeah. if that's like what lights you up, then let it light you up. But you don't think that because you couldn't set it up that you can't then go do the reading or, or whatnot. Right. So I love that. So yeah. did you like one of the fears that I had before I started putting myself out there was like, I had some crazy high expectations for myself. I still do. And like realizing I'm never going to meet my expectations. So like, I wouldn't even try because I was like, I'm not going to be any good. Like, I'm not going to be as good as like the people that I admire. And so I had this like not enoughness, like really early on. Um, do you have any of that? Or because of the teachers that you had, did you were just like, I'm just fucking ready to rock it. <laughs> no, 
Oh my gosh. That's the one thing I love about you is you talk so much about needing to fail, you know, at some point in your journey to really ask yourself, do you want to still do this? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the questions I ask beginner mediums too. I'm like, why are you doing this? Is it a hobby? Is it fun? Like be honest with yourself because the work is so hard it and it's not hard in the mechanics part of it. I mean, anyone can learn to do it, but the self-development, the inside here is so difficult. Like you're going to have to face so many triggers and insecurities and vulnerabilities within yourself. And if you're not prepared for that, oh my gosh, it's, it's going to be hard. And um, absolutely, no, I did not go into this being like, oh my God, I'm so good. I'm, you know, I'm going to be such a great medium. I was petrified, mm -hmm. petrified to the point where I would um, get a booking for a reading and I would like wish that they would cancel because I was so afraid of just not meeting their expectations. And as soon as I started charging for readings, that's when it got worse because I hadn't worked on my own money beliefs and being able to receive in that way. Um, and just having this fear of judgment and expectation put on me, it was so scary. And I ended up taking eight months of canceling all paid readings and just doing free ones because I was not in that good headspace. And finally it clicked and I'm over that hump now. But I, I always like, just like you, I always tell people, I'm like, you don't really know if you're in this for the long haul until you've had something that makes you question whether you should keep going. 100%, 100%. It's like all honeymoon stuff, right? It's like, yeah. rain some butterflies. And then you get your first person that will say like, well, wasn't that good? Or I had actually had a reading by this person and it was like so clear, right? You get like these kind of comments that just like are your worst fear. It's like literally like your worst fear. And then can you lead yourself back to the path? Like if you're meant to be on it, because in truth, not everyone who develops mediumship is like meant to do readings or, you know, I don't want to say like to deter anyone, but not everyone can handle the hot seat, right? It's a, it's a hot seat for sure. And so, and I'm very sensitive. Um, so. I know I've had to lead myself back to this path like at least four times in the past seven years. <laughs> right. So yeah. And I don't like to poo poo on clients that are, you know, in the honeymoon phase where it's just like, Ooh, just wait, but just wait. Right. And yeah. you're going to be tested and you know, it's a bit, you're right. Like the inner healing journey is like so part of this path and they just kind of walk alongside each other. You're like, Oh, I never thought that would bother me, but apparently it does. <laughs> yeah. Now it's to move on. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing a bit of that. And so this actually isn't on our list, but I do kind of want to go here because I wanted to talk about like what attracted me to you. Right. And so, um, you posted, I love your stories, by the way. I love your Instagram. Just love it. Love it. Love it. Like I admire so much of what you do and how open you are and how much you share. And in your, uh, stories one time you're doing these Claire's and <laughs> you were saying like, you said this and it was a mic drop moment for me where I said, do you know that clairvoyance is the least reliable Claire? And I was like, oh, I've been saying this for years, but no one believes me. Um, so talk to me a little bit about this because you always have like a way with words and I love hearing you describe these kind of things. Okay. So I, I think it does blow people's minds when I say this and they almost, it takes them a while to even come around to understanding it. So I always say it like this. So if I were to hold up a, let's say a mug with a drink in it, through your clairvoyance, you're going to see that mug. You may see the drink that's inside, but where's the depth to that? Is it a hot drink? Is it a cold drink? How does the mug feel in my hand? Is it scratchy or is it smooth? Um, what does the drink smell like? And those are all your other clairs that don't get used if you pigeonhole yourself into just clairvoyance. And I think for many, many people, they rely so much on that visual aspect of clairvoyance where they'll say what it is, but things can have such a bigger meaning than just what you see. And so if a medium were to give me a reading and they would tell me, oh, I see an apple, I'm like, okay, well, what does that mean? <laughs> like, you see it, great. That could mean a hundred different things to me. And I want more. I want more depth to it. And... I think with clairvoyance, um, it's just one of those things that is very subjective to the medium. 
and it doesn't quite resonate as much as using the other clairs to give more depth to the reading and especially with um, physical appearance like that's a big one because I know a lot of people fall back when they're learning how to connect to spirit they go into this very like well he was tall or he was short or they had long hair or short hair but it's so subjective to the medium and it, who cares how long their hair was you know <laughs> <laughs> no I think that's fine you know it, something I do with clairvoyance because students like insist on using it so okay let's like let's work with it then and one of the ways I teach people to sustain a link so I'm like I had a student as an example a couple weeks ago she's like I'm seeing like a strobe light and immediately I knew what she was talking about but I was like hey stay with it like what do you feel like follow that energetic stream of that strobe light and she fucking nailed it Tony she was like I feel it's like bothering you and like I feel like your kids are like flickering on and off the lights and the day before my son was standing on a chair flickering the light and it was like making me nauseous and my dog was freaking out. So I was like, stop doing that. And she totally nailed it. So sometimes the clairvoyance people will stop at that strobe light and then they'll like go in their analyticals and they'll be like, mm, I don't know, is it a rave? Like they're calling back on their references or whatever. And if you could just follow it a little bit and it will come up. She felt annoyed, right? She heard my kids like, anyways. Yeah. I love the way that you described that. So Okay. I'm swearing a lot on this podcast episode. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. So I want to get into some of the topics that we wanted to talk about today. And I really appreciate you um, coming on to talk about this. And I'm excited to hear your perspective on this. So um, the number one misconception that we hear often, and you've experienced yourself that we talked about or are going to talk about is needing protection from spirit. So tell me a little bit about this. Oh, this is one that just riles me up, I think, and makes so many people riled up. I have I think out of all of the kind of controversial things I've posted, this is the one that gets the most people on their defenses. Um, so I don't know where to even begin. I guess for some reason, there is this misconception that we need to fear what we don't know. And we don't know a lot about the spirit world. I mean, there's been studies that have been done. I know you've even gone into done studies, right? Through universities or whatever. And I think that a lot of people base their belief systems off of how they were raised, maybe with their religion, um, scary movies that shaped, you know, the way that they view things that they don't know a lot about. And so for some reason, it's been taught now that we need to protect ourselves from the spirit world. And through my experience with working with spirit, I have never once, never once ever felt like I needed to protect myself. Um, I've never encountered anything demonic or scary or anything like that. And I know people's next defense is, well, this happened to me 10 years ago, and how do you explain that? And for me, I always go to the very practical response first. I'm like, well, what did you eat that night? Or was it windy outside? You know, what was going on externally that could maybe explain the experience that you had? And nine times out of 10, I ask people even, what were you going through? Like, what were you feeling when that was happening? And they'll respond, I was scared. Well, when you're scared, of course, things sound scary. And of course, they, your mind goes immediately to the things it can't explain. But if you look at it from a very like rational perspective and you try to eliminate anything that could be scary, then you see it for what it is. Okay, it was my house was settling or a branch hit the window or I scratched my own foot through my toenail, you know, in the bed. <laughs> it wasn't spirit that scratched me. <laughs> um, but for some reason, I think there's still just so many teachers out there who teach from this fear-based ideology that we need to protect ourselves. And I think it does beginner medium such a disservice because they automatically start their path through this fear. And then they transfer those beliefs onto their client who then thinks that maybe because their mom committed suicide, that they didn't make it to spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, how devastating is that? Um, so it's just such a disservice, I think, that people are still teaching fear and protection. And I don't think it's warranted at all. 
Yeah. I like that perspective. And I know that like, it's, I agree. Like I was in a paranormal investigation group for years. I still watch paranormal caught on tape. It's one of my favorite shows. I still watch it because I always wanted to believe in stuff like this. Right. I love most haunted. When I was in high school, I went to Chillingham castle. I stayed the night there a couple times. That was their first episode was there. Like I was like actively looking for this stuff. And not only did we never find anything, but a lot of the homes that were calling us in, was we were always able to kind of come up with evidence and I wasn't the medium at the time. I was the one uh, following the medium taking notes, but we were always able to find like a relative or somebody loving in a spirit. And then it made me actually start thinking about uh, the shows that I watched. I was like, wow, if like you actually change the music, um, the experience would be much different watching these type of shows. But I could see why it's popular. Those shows are hugely popular. Like they're still on, right? Yeah. So people are kind of like feeding into these fears. But I agree, it starts people off in this like fear-based kind of like mindset. I know that people that I've worked with, um, like teens um, who definitely have experiences that are never, I'm like, I'm a medium. And when I see a full apparition, I still get scared. <laughs> like it never becomes normal. And I've only seen one about three times in my life. One time I think it was Jesus. One time it was like my son and one time it was my guide. Um, so again, not scary things, but I definitely remember thinking like I could see why people would think that this is terrifying. And I don't think I'll ever kind of get used to that, but you know, intention, energy goes where intention flows. So I teach people who are afraid of spirits or energy to connect with angels. I'm like, well, let's just like learn to connect with angels then. And then that's what you'll experience more of. Right. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I know a lot of people, um, do house clearings and I'm not poo pooing on those, but I remember in Mavis's <laughs> workshop in 2016, she, it was a huge mic drop moment for me. She said to our group of mediums, you don't need to go around rescuing spirits. There is no such thing as earthbound spirits. And I was like, oh, like what? Like everything <laughs> I believed up until now like is about earthbound spirits and ghosts and all this stuff. Right. So, um, I love that. And I think we need more energetic, maybe not protection, but energetic maintenance around the living. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's the thing too. I mean, there's things that are separate, I believe from mediumship. So you don't need all the crazy tools and the rituals and protection to actually form a connection to communicate with spirit. But on a separate note, if it makes you feel good to light a candle before you do your reading, but you know that you don't need the candle in order to make a good connection or you don't need, you know, the protection or whatever, then do it. If it makes you feel good, then do it, um, which I'm all for, you know, mm -hmm. but I think having people realize that it's not necessary. You don't need all of that stuff in order to make a good connection and bring through evidence and heal your client and all of that stuff. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a topic for sure because it's hard to change people's beliefs and experiences, especially if they've had anything that's really scared them, you know? Yeah. And then what do you think about the argument that people say, well, you're like in a daydream because wherever there's light, there's dark. Right. And so like, yeah. what do you think about that? Yeah, I've actually had this conversation with my husband who's getting kind of more into spirituality and stuff. And he had asked me the same thing. He's like, well, if there's light spirits, then there's got to be dark spirits, right? There's got to be this balance. And I told him, I said, well, to me, I feel like we are the dark. That's exactly what I was going to say too. I'm like, yeah. I think we are the yin to that yang, right? Like, I think this is the experience where we experience darkness. I remember Sylvia saying this in the 90s. She's like, this is hell. Like, there's no hell, like, this is hell. Like, we, we suffer here, we lose our loved ones here, we grieve here, like, this is literally hell. And that was like a really, uh, it took me years to kind of like embrace that concept. Um, because then I love Anita Morgiano and she has the philosophy, what if this is heaven? I'm like, girl, no. <laughs> like, I'm not buying into that this is heaven. I love her books, but I'm like, no, I can't get there. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm like, all the evil that's in the world is caused by us. It's caused by us as humans. Power, greed, control, you know, all those lower vibrational energies, it ca it's caused by us. And as soon as we leave this physical body, we're not that anymore. We're exactly who we always were before that. We were eternal, unconditional love light being, you know, and we become that again. Okay, well, this actually can lead us into our fifth 
topic that we're going to talk about, which is placing those human attributes to spirit. This is kind of like a good segue into that. Um, Cause I would love to know your philosophy. I know Mavis in her teachings, she, we are not allowed to put human aspects to spirit ever. You can't say they are standing nearby. Um, they are coming. You know what I mean? We can't say things like that in her presence. She's like, that's not true. Like, where did you pick up that habit? They're not standing with you. They don't stand. Right. So I yeah. would love to know like your uh, mm. philosophies on this. Yeah. So, um, I love that, that she said that. That's so cool. Um, I think again, it kind of goes back to trying to make it easier for our human mind to understand what we're actually doing. And so I think when we can place human emotions or human attributes onto spirit, it makes it feel more real, more tangible. Um, and we are able to express that better to our clients. So if we tell them, you know, oh, they're giving me a giant hug right now, or he, you know, the spirit person feels really sad that they weren't able to, you know, apologize because of the big fight that you guys had before he passed away. While we can feel maybe the emotion or we have a sense of like acknowledgement of sadness there, the spirit isn't actually sad. That's mm -hmm. a human emotion. That's a human attribute. And one uh, Charlie Kelly, I just took one of his classes last week, and he was saying that the energy of spirit is just energy, but it filters through our own personal lens, and that's how we color the evidence that then gets told to the client. Mm. And so the only way that maybe we can describe this emotion of sadness is by saying the spirit person is sad or feels sad, um, which makes sense for maybe how they were when they were still in their physical body. But now as the spirit being, they're not sad anymore. They're yeah. just acknowledging that that happened and maybe they take responsibility for it, but they're not physically or technically sad anymore. But yeah, I think it's, um, it's something where we're just trying to understand or put like words to something that doesn't quite make sense to our brain. And yeah. then we do that through placing these very human emotions or attributes on spirit, which shouldn't be there to be honest. Yeah. And when I think about this philosophy, for one thing, it's so human to put human attributes on everything. Like we even humanize aliens, like aliens just look like humans with different skin. I'm like, is, could that be true? Like that doesn't even make sense to me. Like why would they all have two eyes and nose and ears? And it just, it doesn't make sense to me. Right. Whereas when I've, I've always been really interested in angel and guide connection. And when I would meditate years ago with Skylar, I was like, you know why? <laughs> it's kind of funny because I'm, I think I'm funny, but I always say like, I'm the only first nations person without a native guide. Like my guide appears to me as like this Tom Cruise, good looking, dark haired, like dude. Right. And so I would go into meditation and ask him. And I say the word him because he's always appeared to me as a male since I was seven. I was like, if like, if you're on the other side, like, are you a male? Like, why do you keep appearing to me as a male? And he said to me, we're actually all just light and we recognize each other by light, but you are more comforted by the presence of a male. So that's why I appear to you as a male and always has, because I've always felt safe with males. Um, you know, my dad was amazing. And so like, I've always just felt um, nurtured by male energy. And plus I, I've always been kind of like a guy's girl. I always played hockey, roller hockey sports, like, I was kind of like a tomboy a little bit. So it made sense to me, but it was a hard thing for me to kind of understand, but it's actually helped me in my mediumship, just understanding that I'm blending with like light. Right. And so that's kind of, I don't talk about human attributes when I'm in my readings, though I am going to get into pet communication. So I'm interested to see how this plays out in pet communication. Cause I would imagine you'd have to give the attributes of the animals a piece of evidence. But I don't know. That's a whole nother podcast episode. But that was the thing that Skylar said to me was, we're just light. We're just like lights rocking around and we recognize each other by our lights. And that's why kids and animals will stare you down. It's not because they, they see you, they see your light and your light shines just a little bit differently than the others. And so, um, that's how come I've always been like, okay, I'm going to stop giving these kind of like human attributes. I'll never tell a client you have a girl guide or a male guide or the girl angel and guy. And there's so much controversy just in the angels is Archangel Gabriel, like female or male, right? Yeah. Like, why are we wasting energy thinking about this? It's like, why can't we just like connect with their light? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I, I get so many people who come to me wanting me to tell them who their guide is mm. and I refuse to do it. I, don't I actually lead them through it and help them. I'm like, well, what do you feel? 
what do you think? Like, because as soon as you tell someone, oh, your guide is a Buddhist monk. Oh, your guide is a Native American shaman. Oh, they're um, a good looking Brad Pitt, you know, whatever. They get that avatar stuck in their head and they cannot forget it. Yeah. And I would rather you connect through energy mm-hmm. and emotion than through this visual of something that someone else told you was the right thing, you know? I'm very much the same. I, I And plus me meeting my guide was like such a profound experience for me. I would never want to rob somebody else of that experience, mm-hmm. right? It's like, no, you just trust me. You will love the experience when you guys like connect and yeah, I don't want to take that power away, right? Yeah. Okay, now I fucking love this topic and this is like very controversial and people I think I ran I ran a poll on this and it was very very divided Mm -hmm. so the saying I'm just going to reword it based off what you wrote me but the saying all mediums are psychic but not all psychics are mediums like what the what tell me your yeah yeah so you know it's funny because I ran a poll on this too on my Instagram and I thought for sure that most of the people who followed me would have said that everyone can be a medium, but it was pretty split. And I was shocked. I was like, oh my gosh, people still believe this. And I have to say too, that that was one of the first things that was taught to me as well. When I first started, you know, my journey was, you know, um, all psychics, um, or yeah, 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 yeah. all mediums are psychic, but not all psychics are mediums. I can't even say it anymore. (laughs) Yeah. And so I think the reason why people say that though is because they're trying to make it exclusive. They're trying to separate the ability between psychism and mediumship and trying to say that, well, mediumship is more difficult. So unless you work really hard or you, you know, take a bunch of classes or whatever, you'll never quite be a medium like I am. It makes it sound snobbish or elite. And I don't like that at all. And my whole thing too is, how you receive information psychically is pretty damn similar to how you receive it mediumistically. So what's exactly. to say that- A lot of people are cross-mingling them. Exactly. And like, what's to say that you're giving a psychic reading and then all of a sudden, bam, grandma comes in. It's the same thing, you know? It's just a different maybe awareness of bringing through um, evidence about a spirit versus evidence about your client. And so I hate that. I hate that quote. And what started me on that little controversial video that I created about that was I saw on someone else's Instagram, uh, that was their caption. And then they, you know, decided to go in and prove why that was true. And it took me everything not to comment on it and be like, oh, but have you ever thought of it like this? You know, because I don't, you know, I let people do their own thing. Um, But it spurred me to say, you know what, it's time to talk about this because too many people believe this. And I was shocked at how split it was between the people that did believe it and the people that didn't was pretty interesting. Well, people are still saying it. So I, here's my history with it. I loved Gordon Higginson. I still do. I still love his lectures and I still listen to them. And, you know, he's a really a grandfather of spiritualism born in the spiritualist church. I loved his charisma. I love his philosophy for the most part though. I mean, of course, as we grow and evolve and mediumship changes, the philosophies will also grow and evolve, right? So not everything he was saying in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s holds true today, much like Sylvia Brown in the nineties and early two thousands, a lot of it has been outdated. And much of what we're talking about today will probably be outdated in 10, 15, 20 years as well, like as we grow and evolve. So I always tell people to be really flexible. But I remember listening to one of his lectures and he said, look, if you're not a medium, I can't help you, right? Like either you're born a medium or you're not. And I remember hearing that in my very early years of mediumship development, it was so unhelpful because then I spent the next years of my mediumship, well, maybe I'm not, right? Like maybe I'm actually not born it. Then all my pendulum work was like, am I a medium? (laughs) And like relying on the freaking Doreen Virtue angel deck to pull the mediumship card, right? And like needing this external validation. And then as I go along and I start teaching, I'm like, it actually doesn't even make sense. Like, why would our creator pick and choose who could communicate with their loved ones to part it? It just doesn't make sense if we are energy and energy is boundless and energy has no, you know, limitations then why would they limit it to just like a select few to not be able to connect in that way? Like it just doesn't make sense. And I agree. I felt like it was kind of like this old boys club, um, you know, 
mentality back in the day that was like, either you're chosen or you're not. Right. Yeah. yeah I exactly. think that there's like, not everyone's meant to awaken to the connection, but that's, you know, divine free will as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I completely agree with that. It's if we're to believe that spirit and their love for us is unlimited and it's unconditional, why wouldn't anyone be able to connect with their loved ones on the other side? Like that's the gift that they give us, you know, whether we choose to pursue mediumship as a career or not. And I totally agree with what you just said too, that not all of us maybe will awaken to those abilities throughout our you know, time here in this lifetime, but some people will. Um, but knowing that we can all have that ability, like even clients that come to me that are very skeptical, they've never, they don't even really know anything about this work. I tell them all the time, I'm like, do you, do you miss your grandpa? Do you miss your dad who's in spirit? And they're like, yeah, of course. And I'm like, well, just pay attention, you know, maybe they'll send you something and it'll be a sign. And, you know, just because I'm giving you this doesn't mean you can't do it for yourself. You know, and I think that that's huge, especially for people who are dealing with grief is knowing that, you know, a, their favorite song comes on the radio. That was your mom that sent that, you know, that's beautiful. And just being open to that, just opening their eyes a little bit to the possibility that their loved ones are still there and they're still around us. And you don't need me to tell you that, you know, they'll tell you themselves. And I think that that's, you know, such a gift. Yeah. So just a bit of a disclaimer to the people on YouTube watching and the podcast. So I have a puppy rescue. He just woke up from his nap. So you might hear some noise in the background and he's wearing a cone right now. So you just heard him scratching, <laughs> scratching his cone. So I apologize, Tony. I thought we could make it through the whole podcast episode. Um, okay. So just, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And hopefully this just gives, you know, we're not asking the listeners to like, listen to us and defer everything you've heard before. It's like, you know, let this just be some conversation to get you thinking about maybe different perspectives than you've heard before. And you know, your own truth, right? We all have different truths that carry us and that we, um, you know, that light us up. So just think about what lights you up and if it makes you feel good, right? That's a more helpful thought than, than what doesn't make you feel good. Okay. So I kind of, okay. So I feel like we may have addressed the stuck, stuck spirits or ghosts, like through the conversation around the protection, but is there anything else you wanted to say on that? Yeah, that's a big one, you know, and it's, it's so funny because I don't know really, I, I mean, I'm guessing that it comes from movies or from Hollywood or just that belief system, I guess, of just, you know, ghosts and spirits and everything like that. Um, but one thing that I think has deterred me from that, and just like you, I mean, I believed in ghosts. I wanted to live in a haunted house my whole life. Like, I still love to go to cemeteries and just kind of like feel the spookiness, you know? Even though I know that there's nothing there, it's still just like, I don't know, it just is comforting in that way. I'm a weirdo, I guess. I'm a Scorpio, <laughs> so I like it. <laughs> um, but through my experience with connecting to spirit, they have never said to me or told me or have I felt that they are not fully in the spirit world at the time that I connect with them. And to me, it's instantaneous. Um, I was at a fair one time and I had this woman book a reading with me and she came in and um, she wanted me to connect with a young woman who was her friend. And so I connected with her. I'm bringing through evidence, you know, going on about her condition with her passing and everything. And it wasn't until the end of the reading that the woman told me, yeah, she just died two hours ago. Oh. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so that to me just kind of showed that as soon as we leave this physical body, like we're energy, we're a light source, we're, you know, whatever, we are instantaneously in that spirit world if we want to give it a location or a place or whatever. And there is no like waiting period. There is no like judgment trial period where it's like, are you worthy enough to go here? Um, and I think why a lot of people believe that there's such things as ghosts is because they get like the lights flickering, they get the knocks on the wall, they hear the like voices through the EVPs or whatever. And I do believe that we can leave energetic imprints 
in a space. So just like when someone has a huge argument in a room of your house and then they leave and you walk in there and you're kind of like, ooh, feels weird in here, you know? You're picking up on that vibe, that emotional energy that was left behind. And I think that's where people think ghosts come from is this residual energy that happened in a location and they're tapping into that. They're sensitive to it. Mm. But is it an intelligent spirit? Is it someone's, you know, grandfather that's come through or whatever? Most times it's not. It's just the residual energy. And to me, I feel like with my mediumship, I'm connecting with intelligence. I'm connecting with, you know, spirits who are for the client that I'm reading for. I don't get random spirits. I don't get people that just spirits that come to me out of nowhere and I'm just connecting with them and I have to find their loved one to deliver these messages. No, they come because their client is sitting in front or their loved one is sitting in front of me as my client. That's the only reason they come is because they love them. They're not just going to be hanging out in a random castle, you yeah. know, or a random haunted house. <laughs> Waiting for you to go to them. Exactly. Yeah. And I love, um, this is going to lead us into our final topic, but like Mavis just yesterday, or I think it was just the other day she was saying, um, I don't mean to keep quoting her. It's just cause I keep learning. I'm learning from her right now. So I'm like, Ooh, this totally ties in what she was just talking about where she has this belief that like, obviously the world of spirit aligns us with our clients, right? Like we become preferred and referred on the spirit side. Like Danielle, she knows all about like this topic, like definitely go get your loved one, go hook up with her. And therefore she feels that the spirit world is very much around us like weeks before our reading. Like they know that we're going to be with their loved ones and they're trying to inspire us and acclimate to our energy or whatnot. So this kind of like leads into the topic about people being like overwhelmed with spirit, people being bothered by spirit, people being having spirit attachment. Um, and I do hear this a lot from people who are like, you know, I don't want the spirit around like a week before the reading and stuff. Like, what do you think about that kind of stuff? Cause that's a very common, um, belief as well. Yeah. So firstly, I tell people just turn it off. <laughs> it sounds so simple, but it really is. And I think a lot of people don't realize that they actually have the control of when they're aware of spirit. You know, I can sit here in front of you and I'm not connecting to your loved ones unless I set out with that intention to do that, then I'll do it. But otherwise we're just having a conversation. And I think for a lot of people, especially when they first start, they can be so open, you know, maybe on an unconscious or subconscious level that they don't realize that they're kind of giving permission to spirit to give them things, you know, or to communicate with them in some way. And so the first thing I always tell people is just turn it off. Don't be aware of it. Be in your human experience right now. Don't be connecting to spirit and it'll stop. Um, and then the second thing, you know, with people saying, you know, they're bothering me or they're keeping me up at night or they're giving me anxiety or whatever else. I think that comes with a lack of knowing how to um, kind of let the evidence just go through you. You know, some people really hold on to things like when they talk about the passing and they get like stomach aches and it's like, oh my God, an hour later, my stomach is still hurting. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Like, it's not yours, let it go, you know? Um, and it's the same thing. I think people get so wound up and like, oh my gosh, I have this spirit who's keeping me up at night. They wake me up at 2.22 every morning and they won't let me sleep. And it's like, no, that's you. <laughs> you're doing that. You're aware of it and you're allowing it to happen. And as soon as you kind of set that boundary and not that spirit needs boundaries. So don't get me wrong on that. It's not that they're trying to bother you yeah. at all. I don't even subscribe to that, but it's your awareness that is open to that communication. And that's why it's happening. I hope that makes sense. That does make sense. And I, I feel very similar. Like, you know, I used to watch Most Haunted and I forgot the meet Derek Akora, right? Where he'd be like, oh, take it off me, take it off me. Like, you know, and it, part of my gift of mediumship is the feeling like spirit will blend and impress upon me on my physical body things that they experience. So I will feel a stroke. I will feel, I actually felt poisoning once come up my hand and I didn't, it wasn't overwhelming. I was like, 
you know, it's like trying to describe what you're feeling and she knew exactly what it was. And so I will get these physical things, but I don't feel like I'm being attacked. I'm like, okay, Danielle loves her clairsentience. So you got to kind of like make it, make it real. Don't give her the sights. She doesn't want to see, right. She just wants to feel, I feel that's kind of my guide's role too, where he's just like, Hey, this is how Danielle likes to work. Practice up, brush up. Your loved one's going to be in front of her in 72 hours. If she doesn't cancel. Right. <laughs> And so I do feel like we have so much more sovereignty than, than we're led to believe when it comes to our connection with the world of spirit. And I do also like, I love my human experience. I'm never trying to like bypass it. I'm actually very aware that like, I actually signed up for this like life experience. So I, outside of my readings and my teachings, I forget I'm a medium, like literally, like I was in town the other day. Someone's like, are you Squamish medium? I was like, yes. Yes. I forget it. Like I literally forget it. Like I'm a mom. I drive a minivan. My hair is messy. And it's like, I'm not thinking about spiritual things all the time. So I don't get that awareness everywhere. So I think you nailed it perfectly. And I'm like, Oh, that's kind of what I experience. And then after my readings, I just simply say to the world of spirit, I'm like, I hope I made you proud today. Um, thank you for allowing me to connect with your loved ones. And I leave what's not mine to carry back to you. Right. And I just simply say that prayer. Like I just release everything emotionally, physically, that's not mine to carry. And I choose to carry what is mine. Right. Like we have so much power, like using that word, um, to kind of like create the experiences that we want. So, you know, sometimes I found with some clients, um, years ago when I was attracting clients like this, I don't really attract clients like this anymore, but they wanted so badly to feed into the drama and they weren't willing to see outside the drama of it. It's like, I could teach, tell them everything, but they're not going to do it because there's a piece of them that's like addicted to drama. Right. And so I find like, there's like a little bit of that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I had a mentorship student who came from a background of kind of like fear and having weird things happen in our house and things. And through working with her for a few months, I tried to explain to her, I'm like, well, why is your first instinct to go to something scary? Or why is your first instinct to be afraid of it? Why don't we take a step back? And when something happens, I want you to be curious about it. I want you to be inquisitive, like, oh, what was that? Why did that make that noise? Or why did that happen? Or whatever. Because when you change your mindset away from the fear and into curiosity, it's no longer scary. And you take back your own power in a way where you're then in control. And just like you, I have a very human life, very human experience. Like I know I chose this life on purpose and I'm going to live it. You know, if I want to sit in front of the computer and watch makeup tutorials on YouTube all day, I'm going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't always need to be Tony the medium, you know, it's, it's my passion and it's my purpose and I love doing it, but I know that it's not all I'm meant to do. And mm -hmm. I think that's the thing too, is I always try to tell my students is have experiences, have as many human based experiences as you can, because the more that you experience, the more spirit has yes. to work with for you, you know, learn a new language, go to a different country, you know, meet a new friend that you wouldn't normally have. That's all different experiences that now spirit is going to say, oh yes, I can use that now to yeah. help them. You know, that's what I say. Like the prerequisite to mediumship is a life well lived, right? Literally a life well lived. Like I love reading non self-help books, non spiritual books. Like I I'm obsessed with the Kings and Queens of England, like the history of it. And so like, those are kind of like the books and a name will come up or a situation will come up that I just read and it like just builds your references. Right. So I love that. Well, this has been like a really fun, energizing conversation. I know we have so much more to talk about, so I definitely want to have you back on. I think people are going to love this kind of like open and frank discussion. It might ruffle some feathers, but it might give people a, maybe a fresh perspective to look at things, right? And so I just yeah. leave it with people to like remain flexible. Um, you know, don't subscribe to everything we're saying, like go to spirit with it, meditate on it, ask your own guides about it and see what you're inspired to think. And if things change and things shift and, you know, as long as what you're believing and thinking is helpful for you and it's like helping you in your life, then it's doing no harm. But I know some of the beliefs that we talked about today were the opposite. When I believed them, they were not helpful and they actually held me back. So then I had to choose and make a decision do I want to subscribe to this belief for the rest of my life and feel like this? Right. Yes. Oh, that's so perfectly said. Yeah. If it's not helping you, then it's not doing you any good. And that's so true. I mean, 
trying to sit down for a reading for 30 minutes and meditate and connect. And it's like, I'm neglecting my son downstairs. I'm like, here you go, play some Minecraft for a while, you know, while I go and do this reading for the next two hours. And it's like, man, I could only ever do one a day because of that. And it just, it was too much. And you start to feel guilty because you didn't do it. Or maybe you drank a cup of coffee and you know, now you feel like you won't connect. It's like you put all these limitations on yourself. It's never spirit. It's always us. Yes. And yeah. I love it, Tony. Thank you for coming on. So how can people connect with you? And I'll make sure all the links are on the show notes. People could just pop on down. But um, how can people find out more about you and where do you hang out? Yeah. So I'm mostly on Instagram. So my Instagram is Soul Star Medium. Um, I do have a Facebook page as well. If you'd like to check that out, I do um, reply to comments and messages and everything through there. Um, my website is soulstarreadings.com and you can look at all of my services on there. Um, am I allowed to like talk about my program? No, okay. Oh, scarcity in this world. I'm like, no, you go. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm currently beta testing a beginner's mediumship course right now, and it's going so well. It's so much fun. I love getting to work with these people. Um, but the full course is going to launch in January 2021. Um, it's going to be very small group, so I like to make sure I'm giving individualized attention to everybody that's there. I love to be able to see them read um, so I can give them feedback on everything. And the one thing that I love about my course is we don't just go into the practical application of mediumship, which I think is important, but everybody does that. I like to talk about the self-development, your philosophy, you know, your um, insecurities, your vulnerabilities that will pop up for you during readings, as well as the presentation, because that's another one. Maybe we'll talk about that in part two, Danielle, but like mm -hmm. presentation and bad habits that come up during readings. Um, that's a huge one for me and just being as professional as possible because you, you're ultimately serving spirit and you're trying to leave the people who come to you feeling better than when they first came to you. And if you can do that, if your goal is to bring healing and love and just honor spirit, then I think we're all doing the best job that we can. 100%. I love that. Okay. So we'll definitely link everything in the show notes, whether you're on YouTube or the podcast here. So check it out, check Tony out. I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. We'll definitely have her back for part two, where we'll talk about the bad habits of mediumship. I think that that's a good topic. So we'll do that before the year's up. So, all right, guys, thank you for tuning in.